children are a gift from the Lord. A gift because God is the one who creates them. He forms them in the womb and he gives them to the parents. Humans have 22 pairs of numbered chromosomes and one pair of sex chromosome XX or XY for a total of 46. Each pair contains two chromosomes, one coming from each parent, which means that children inherit half of their chromosome from their mother and half from the father. That explains why the child looked like both his mom and his dad. The child will also have some qualities, some characteristics, some talent from his mom and some from his dad. Sometimes the child will have more qualities of his mom and less of his dad or more from his dad and less from his mom. And a parent seeing his or her own qualities in the child may have the tendency to favor that child over another child who has more qualities of the other parent. This morning, we are going to see a couple who did just that. The father favored the son who had qualities like his own. The mom favored the other son who had qualities like her own. It might seem normal, but it is a sin. It is a sin forbidden by God in Deuteronomy chapter 21. The Bible forbids it because it causes a chain of terrible trouble in the home. It causes jealousy and a lot of family friction, as we will see in our text. So turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 21, as we take a look at the story of Isaac. I know some people say Isaac, but it's an E. Israel, Italy, Iran, Iraq, Isaac. So there are four people in the story of this family. Number one, you have Isaac, the unspiritual father. Number two, you have Rebecca, the unsurrendered wife. Number three, you have Jacob, the unscrupulous brother. And number four, you have Esau, the unsaved son. Eventually, we will see the story of each person. Today, we will start with Isaac, the head of our soul, and later we will see the other three. The Holy Spirit is going to give us a guided tour of the dysfunction, the disorder in Isaac's own life. It will make you tremble. Most of the improper things that go on in our homes, we manage to hide from others. But we cannot hide them from the all-seeing eye of God. And God can decide to open up our home or any home for inspection, as he did Isaac's home here in Genesis. Who knows, he may open yours one day. There was a time in Isaac's life when he was an outstanding type of Christ. At one time, he was the most Christ-like man on earth. We will see him obedient unto death. Even the death of sacrifice and blood, he was willing to die. 
We will see him as a well-beloved son, doing always those things that please the Father, willing to go all the way even to sacrifice his own life on Mount Moriah. But things will change as he gets older. Here's the story. Verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah, and he said, uh, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah, as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And, and Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. Sarah had carried the burden of childlessness for many years, a heavy burden in that culture at that time. And people must have smiled when they heard that her husband's name was Abraham father of a multitude, and he was the father of only one boy, Ishmael. That was far from a multitude. But here, all of Sarah's reproach ended. People rejoiced with her at the arrival of a son named Isaac. The birth of Isaac involved more than just Parental joy. His birth meant the fulfillment of God's promise. When God called Abraham in chapter 12, he promised to make him a great nation that would bless the whole world. It also meant the rewarding of patience. Abraham and Sarah had to wait 25 years for their son to be born. And it is through faith and patience that we inherit the promises, we are told in Hebrews 6. The birth of Isaac was definitely the revelation of God's power. That was one reason why God waited so long. He wanted Abraham and Sarah to be as good as dead so that their son's birth would be nothing short of a miracle of God, not a marvel of human nature. So little Isaac was the fulfillment of God's promise. He was God's reward for patience, and he was the revelation of God's power, what God can do. Abraham did not forget God's commandment about circumcision, as we saw in Genesis chapter 17. He made sure that his son was under the terms of God's covenant. He circumcised them on the eighth day, verse 4. Then children would, were weaned before three years old. Ishmael by then was 17 years old. Abraham made a great feast to celebrate the weaning of the child. At that feast, Ishmael mocked little Isaac. Galatians 4.29 says that he persecuted him, but gives no detail. Sarah told her husband to get rid of this family. Agar and her teenage boy had to go. And God confirmed to Abraham that it was the right thing to do. The two boys could not grow up together. There could have been another Cain and Abel story. So he packed them a lunch and he sent them away. Then Genesis chapter 22, we have a test of faith. 
Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and he sacked his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering, arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac's his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram, offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Here we just skipped 20 years from 1896 B.C. When, when Isaac was born to 1876 when he is now 20 years old. Do not picture a five, six-year-old being offered as a sacrifice like I've seen in some of the book of the stories of Abraham. He was 20 years old. Abraham was 120 years old. In verse 2, we see that God never acknowledged Ishmael, the work of the flesh, as Abraham's son. Only Isaac was the product of faith, and God said, Isaac, your only son. We also have the first mention of love in the Bible. It is not the love of a mother for a child. It is not brotherly love. It is not the love of a man for his wife, not even the love of a man for God. It is the love of a father for his son. First, the test was a test of love. Would Abraham love his son more than God? No, you're not touching my son. You're not, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to do that for you. I'm not going to kill my only son that I waited all these years for. Isaac was God's gift to Abraham. If the gift becomes more important than the giver, it becomes an idol. Remember that, parents. I have met many Christian idolaters whose children were more important than God. They loved them more than God. They failed the test of love, loving God with all their heart, mind, and soul. Our children should not come before God or have priority over God. Unfortunately, they do. Next, the test was a test of faith. Abraham said in verse 5, the lad and I will come back. He had the faith. That's faith. 
When Isaac wondered what they would offer to God by faith, Abraham said, hey, God will provide a lamb for a burnt offering. Don't worry. Not his son. He had no doubt. In verses 9 to 14, after everything was in place, Isaac was on the wood ready to be killed. The Lord called from heaven, verse 11, and he told Abe not to lay his hand on the lad, verse 12. He had passed the test of faith. Abraham saw a ram caught in a brush, verse 13, so he offered it instead of his son. Later, God provided salvation for mankind on that same mount. He died for us right there. We have the promise of redemption through Jesus Christ in verse 18. There is another gap of 17 years between chapter 22 and chapter 23. We do not know what Isaac did during those 17 years. We know that he was obedient to his father. When Isaac was 37 years old, his mother Sarah died in 1859 BC. That's in chapter 23. The mother was 127 years old. She was bur buried in Hebron in the land of Canaan in chapter 23, verse 2. Isaac was getting older. And his dad was concerned about him not being married. So in chapter 24, he made plan to find Isaac a bride. It was three years after Sarah, his mom, died. Isaac was now 40 years old, still unmarried. We must remember that in that culture, the parent chose the spouse for the children. Even at 40 years old, it was not proper for Isaac to go and choose his own wife. Abraham sent his oldest servant to pick a partner for his wife. Isaac was not consulted about it at all. And he could have resented that. He could have said, Dad, I know I cannot pick my own partner for marriage, but seriously, your servant is going to pick for me? Isaac never said that. He did not say anything. He submitted to the will of his father. Then in chapter 24, we see the search for a wife for this boy, 40-year-old boy, Isaac. We see three steps taken to obtain a wife for Isaac. Step number one was choosing the girl. And we see that in verses 1 to 28. He chose a hardworking girl, ready and willing to draw water for him and for all the camels. Step number two is convincing the parents, verses 34 to 52. And then step number three was hearing from the girl, verses 54 to 67. That was an unusual step. Usually the girl did not have a say into it. Now, step number one, choosing is the most important. Some Christians today resort to their version of a Gideon's fleece. They come up with a fleece like certain color of a sweater and take that as a sign or that that's the one. If you see a red sweater coming in, and foolishness. This chapter shows far better guidelines for choosing a partner. It is the best in Scripture regarding this subject. And if you are not married, write this down. What to look for in a mate. And I will mention seven requirements. The first one is a spiritual requirement. Abraham started with this requirement 
And we all need to start here. He told his servant, you shall not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites. In verse 3, the Canaanites were pagan. They were not saved. We are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Spiritually mixed marriages are a nightmare for both partners. This is one of the most important requirements. It is a spiritual requirement. Number two, the next requirement is the role requirement. If the partners do not know their specific role in marriage or will not practice it, there will be huge marital problem. Abraham did not want Isaac to leave Canaan and go back to Aran, the place Abraham had left at God's command. The woman to be Isaac's wife was to make her life be helpful, auxiliary to Isaac's life. His career, not hers, has priority in the marriage since he was appointed by God to provide for the family, not her. Wrong role. That thinking does not go over too well in our society today, but their marriage do not do too good either because of that. Both husband and wife must know and understand their role appointed by God. The third one is the dependability requirement. When Abraham's servant arrived in Aran, he prayed a very specific prayer to God in verses 12 to 14. And some people think that he was putting out a fleece like Gideon, but this was very different than putting out a fleece. The servant's wise prayer was asking for a girl with some good character qualities. And the first character requirement in his prayer was dependability. A girl you can depend on. His prayer was specific. The selection should be made from among those coming to the well. This meant that the girl would be dependable. She would not be a lazy girl. Those who came to the well at evening were dependable girls. You could count on such girls to do their duty and to feed, to give water to the animal. In selecting a wife for Isaac, the servant wanted a dependable girl, and you should too. Number four is the appearance requirement. Abraham's servant did not ignore appearance as one of the requirements for Isaac's wife. It says in verse 16 that the girl was very beautiful to behold. Looks are clearly an important part of the choice. A person must enjoy looking at his or her mate. He or she cannot be as ugly as sin. He must be pleasant. But a good appearance speaks of more than just the external beauty. It also speaks of in, in, interior, inside beauty, good habits, habits that are essential to the well-being of the marriage. Lack of good habits regarding one's appearance can cause serious problem in marriage. Number five, we see the moral requirement. This might be number five, but it's a very important requirement. It says, Rebecca was a virgin. 
neither had any man known her. Verse 16, the moral purity of Rebecca is emphasized in our text by the double statement of her purity. Not only does the text say that she was a virgin, but it also repeats the fact by saying, neither had any man known her sexually. She was pure. This was a qualification that the servant would certainly insist upon for a wife for Isaac. It was understood in those days that he was to look for a virgin. Moral purity cannot be stressed too much in selecting a mate. It takes much strength of character to produce a good marriage. If you want a good marriage, marry one who has impeccable morals. In this day and age, mistakes are easily made by those who do not have a close relationship with God. Repentance is important. Stopping and turning away from that lifestyle is extremely important. God looks at a repented prostitute and he sees a virgin, and you can too. Number six is the unselfish requirement. Unselfishness was also a character attribute that the servant was looking for in the girl. The servant added in verse 14, if she says drink and I will also give your camels a drink, let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. The girl who is going to stop her work to give a stranger a drink of water and then volunteer to water his camels is definitely not a selfish person. Do you know how much water camels drink? A lot of water. So unselfishness is extremely important if a marriage is to last and be pleasant. Marriage is a life of sharing and helping. It is required in both husband and wife to be unselfish. Many marriages do not make it because one or both of them are selfish. And the last one, number seven, is the family relationship requirement. The servant did not ask for lodging. In the story, Rebecca offered lodging in her home, an opportunity for the servant to observe her relationship with her family. She got along very well with her mother, with her father, with her brother also. There will be tension and anxiety in a marriage if the family does not get along well or do not have a good relationship. So that was step number one, finding the girl. Step number two is convincing the parent. That is also important. It is difficult enough to get along in a marriage. You do not need added friction or fighting with the in-laws or outlaws. It will make the grandkids happy to have a good relationship with the grandparents. Then step number three is the choice by the girl. Even though the custom of Abraham's day was for the parents to make the choice, and in Rebecca's case here, it involved her own decision. In fact, the making known of her choice is what really decided the case. She could have said, no, I'm not going with a stranger. I don't want to get married to a guy I've never seen before. In verse 58, she said, I will go. And that required some faith. Choosing a mate has to be done carefully and prayerfully. 
Abraham was very careful, and so was his servant in choosing a bride for his son Isaac. After deciding to follow Jesus, getting married is the most important decision Christians have to make. A marriage that is not according to God's word or is not from the leading of the Holy Spirit will not be blessed. So she went with the servant. She met Isaac. He took her in his mother's tent, and he took her as his wife. Verse 67 of chapter 24. They got married and lived happily ever after with some rough patches. Then in chapter 25, Isaac's dad got married again to a woman named Keturah. We have no details, no information how it went at home with a stepmom. But they got a bunch of kids. And 38 years later, Abraham died. He was 175 years old. Both boys got together. Ishmael was 89 years old. Isaac was 75 years old. And they buried their father. Again, we do not know anything about Isaac for those 38 years. What we know is that his wife, Rebekah, was barren. And Isaac prayed for her, verse 21. And the Lord granted his request. His wife got pregnant and got pregnant with twin, twin boys. They named the first one Esau and the second one Jacob. And we will see more about those boys as we look at their individual story later. The twin boys not only looked different, but they were different in personality. Esau was a tough outdoorsman, a successful hunter, and he got that from the chromosome of his dad. Jacob was a homeboy, a mama's boy, not effeminate, but a mild man who loved to be in the house, who loved to cook, and he got that from the chromosome of his mother. The two were like the odd couple, Felix and Oscar. Then we get to Genesis chapter 26. In the first five verses there, Isaac reacted to the famine just like his father Abraham had done. He ran. He, he journeyed south. The Lord appeared to him in Gerar, about halfway to Egypt, and warn him not to go to Egypt. God also reconfirmed to him the unconditional covenant that he had made with Abraham to make his descendant like the stars of heaven. Then we read in verse 6, So Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, lest the man of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and he saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. It's called PDA. Public display of affection. Yeah, PDA. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have laid with your wife and would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac showed, sowed in that land and reaped the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The men began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very prosperous. 
for he had possession of flock, possession of herd, and great numbers of servants, so the Philistine envied him. Here we see the deception of Isaac. He reacted to fear just like his dad had. He misrepresented his wife as his sister to the men of Gerar. It is the sad story of a father's weakness being repeated in the son. Like father, like son. When the deceit was exposed and rebuked, Isaac confessed. Verse 9. Confession leads to blessing. And Isaac became very wealthy there. Now, let's take a look at Isaac when he got older. Turn to Genesis 27. This is a sad chapter. Verse 1, now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered him, here I am. Then he said, behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Things had been going wrong in Isaac's home for quite some time now. At first, Isaac had a great relationship with God. But growing older, things change, and often it changes in people. He became a tragic type of a carnal, worldly Christian. The situation we see in his home when suddenly the Holy Spirit opens the door of his home and walks us in unannounced did not arise in a single day. The thing that we see here had been growing for many years. Isaac might have been glad to exchange years of his life if only this sad chapter could have been erased. But no, the Holy Spirit saw fit to expose it for us to learn from it. Isaac must have wished with all his heart he could turn back the clock, but he could not. And most of us have sad chapters recorded in God's great book that we would like to erase, but we cannot. Maybe Isaac thought he was going to die. He was 137 years old, and his half-brother Ishmael died at that age. But he was wrong. He lived for another 43 years. He did not die until he was 180 years old. Convinced he was going to die, he decided to make out his will. There was one special thing he had to pass along, and that was the patriarchal blessing. It involved three things, the family property, the family priesthood, and the family pedigree, the right to be in a direct line to Christ. By this time, Isaac had played favoritism in his family for so long, he thought he could play favorites in this matter also. He thought he could pass on a spiritual blessing in the energy of the flesh. He wanted his favorite son, Esau, to be the one through whom the promised Messiah would come. He turned a blind eye to Esau's carnality and worldliness. He deliberately tried to bypass God's known will in this matter. The blessing was to go to Jacob, 
the younger of the twin. Surely Isaac knew that Esau was not fit to be the guardian of spiritual things. He had already brought grief and sorrow to his parents by marrying a couple of pagan girls in chapter 26. Regardless of what the Lord had said, regardless of how Esau had lived, Isaac made up his mind that Esau should have the blessing. My boy, get your bow, get your gear, go get me some venison, make me taste, make me a tasty meal, then I will give you the blessing, he says in verse 4. Paul shed some light on this, and he says in Romans 8, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. The carnal mind, he adds, is enmity, enemy against God. We see a carnal mind here. Earlier in his life, Isaac had displayed the mind of Christ. He was an obedient man. He was willing to offer himself. Now he was a carnal man with a carnal mind. The chapter uncovers the spiritual drift of many years. For years, while he imagined he was heading in the proper direction, Isaac had been drifting farther and farther away from the place where his tent and his altar had been at the beginning. Now he had drifted so far, he could do something absolutely contrary to the known word of God. He was able to persuade himself that he was doing a spiritual thing. He had a carnal mind, and the carnal mind is enmity against God. We must beware of the danger of drifting away. Earlier in life, Isaac had displayed the mind of Christ. We often do that. But he drifted away and became a carnal man with a carnal mind, and it is possible for us to do that. The chapter uncovers a spiritual drift over many years. Thinking that he was going the right way, he had drifted farther and farther from the place where he had been at the beginning. He had drifted so far. He could easily convince himself to do something contrary to the word of God. He had no problem with that. He was sure he was doing a spiritual thing. He assumed he was still a spiritual man, but he was a carnal man. Stay close to God. Stay close to God's word. Do not drift away. It is very easy. As people get older, to become carnal. In the rest of the chapter, his mother, also guilty of favoritism, decided to help Jacob get the blessing and the birthright. She was willing to deceive her own husband to accomplish that. Both parents, Isaac, and Rebecca acted on the God-dishonoring proverb which says, God helps those who help themselves. It is not true. It is a lie from the pit of hell. The Lord helped those who have come to the end of themselves, those who have tried everything and cannot help themselves. Isaac's wife gave clear instruction to her boy Jacob. And she accepted full responsibility. If you get busted, I'll take the blame. She disguised her 77-year-old son, Jacob, to trick his almost blind father. This is the first case of Halloween trick or treat in the Bible. 
77 years old with a costume on trying to trick the dad. Isaac believed he was talking to Esau, and he blessed the wrong kid. Esau got so mad, he promised to kill Jacob as soon as the father dies. God does not need our cunning or our deceit to accomplish his will. He does not need Rebekah to make sure Jacob would get the blessing. He did not need her help. He did not. Human nature is prone to scheme in order to help God. We are to seek spiritual blessing the right way. If not, we will have years of sorrow. Then finally, in chapter 28, Isaac submitted to the mighty hand of God and finally blessed his son Jacob and charged him not to take a wife from the Canaanite, but to go to his uncle uh, to take a wife from them. Jacob was now a lonely 77 years old fugitive. He never saw his parents again. And the story ends in chapter 35, verse 27. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriat Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelled. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died. He was gathered to his people, being old, full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So Isaac died when he was 180 years old. His two sons, Jacob and Esau, got together. They were 120 years old. They came to Hebron and they buried their dad there. And that was 1716 B.C. Isaac had quite a life, and we have a lot to learn from this man. It is by God's design that a child might be more like his mom than his dad. That does not justify the mom to favor this child who is more like her than another kid who is more like his dad. Isaac was a godly man, but not a strong leader. Whenever dispute with local people over water rights erupted, Isaac's response was to move away again and again rather than engage in the conflict. He avoided all conflicts. He even lied about his wife to protect his own life. In the home, he was not much of a spiritual leader, and he was not a good disciplinarian either. When his older son married pagan women, he did not say anything. We know that Isaac was saved and had a relationship with God, but little is said of Isaac's personal relationship with God. Nothing in the text suggests that Isaac's relationship with the Lord was as close as his father Abraham had been. Isaac reminds us that it is not necessarily necessary for a son to be great, as great as his father, to have a significant role in God's plan. Many dads try real hard to have their son follow in their footsteps to be great, but it might not be God's plan. They're forcing a kid to do something that they would like to see that is not of God. Isaac is not known for bold actions or great achievement. He was guilty of favoritism. He favored the kid who was more like him. Then his wife compensated and she favored the other kid who was more like her. Both husband and wife sinned and they had to pay a price for it. That favoritism caused jealousy and it caused a lot of friction. We must avoid any type of favoritism. The Bible forbids it. In Deuteronomy 21, so both Isaac and Rebekah were guilty and everyone in the family paid a price for it. So avoid favoritism. Next week, we will continue with the story of the wife, Rebecca.
Isaac did not have a good chance because he did not like confrontation when he was young. If people did something wrong, rather than confront them and tell them that it was wrong, he would move away. He did not like any type of confrontation. When his son started marrying a bunch of unsafe women, he did not say anything to him. And he still wanted to bless him before he died. He had become carnal. And if you're a person young that cannot do confrontation, don't like confrontation and walk away, be careful, because as you get older, you're going to get worse. And you're going to tolerate sin in your family, in your children, and will not say anything, because you don't like confrontation. You don't like to stand up for what is right. Isaac was that type of man. He would not stand up to anyone at any time. So it was easy for him to become a carnal man and to tolerate evil and be willing to do something totally against God in his old age. Be careful with that. Be very careful not to become carnal as you get older. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May you bless your life, your home, your family, your children, and may he help you to stand up for what is right and not look the other way, which is so easy to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.